So um, this week's been an interesting week in as much as you get the readings to prepare a talk and, and I read them and I go, yeah, okay. And I looked at this one and thought, mm, okay, okay. That worries me a bit. Don't really want to do that. Okay. And this week has been a real battle. Every aspect of this week has been challenging in one way or another. So when it came to pulling all this together, there was a real sense of confusion and is this right, is this wrong? And I was so focused on what I was doing that I'd kind of pushed God out of the way. I was like, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I sat down and I said, Lord, what is it? What is it? And we're continuing on through Luke's Gospel, and Luke chapter 12 is entitled Warnings and Encouragements. Um, and the word warning always kind of instills within me a sense of panic. You know, if, I, if I'm not going the right way, if I get it wrong. And um, I, I think that chapter 12 in Luke is one of those chapters that has both elements, and it shows us how how great our God is, how much he loves us, but also that we have decisions to make and we have choices to make and we have to be ready. There's a little bit between what we heard last week, the parable of the rich fool that Glyn spoke to us about and the passage that we're looking at today. And it's a section on worry. And Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Mark Twain said, I'm an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happen. And it's so true, isn't it? And Ruth's picture really spoke to me this morning, the fact that sometimes we cannot see what's in front of us. All we have to do is keep moving forward. I was really encouraged by that picture this morning. Really encouraged. Worry changes nothing. It just robs us of the joy in the present. So if you're worried about something this morning, try to just leave it at the foot of the cross. Try to focus on what God wants to say to you this morning. You may not like the words I use. You may not like the style I use. That's okay. But God has an individual message for each one of us this morning. And there was a picture before the service of someone using a pair of binoculars and at the end, all there was was Jesus. So let's focus on that. So let's look at today's reading. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Interesting, the, the choice there, your father has been pleased, not will be pleased, has been pleased. And in fact, the prayer that Glyn just prayed, those words were the same, have been has been pleased, have been pleased in the birth of uh, Esther there. And I thought, isn't that unusual? Has been rather than will be, as if it's in the future. It's now, it's already done. He's already given us the kingdom. He's already sent Jesus. We've already got it. We can have it now within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. How amazing is that? God's kingdom on earth now. We're just getting a glimpse of what it's going to be like. How exciting is that? And he goes on to talk about selling your possessions, give them to the poor, purses that won't wear out, treasure in heaven that won't fail. We talked a lot about that last week, what Glyn did, about money in the world and where is our focus. You know, we can, we can have stuff, but stuff isn't important. And I stand here as a hypocrite because I worry about stuff. I hoard stuff. You should see the number of books I've got that I've never read. And handbags that I have, that I use occasionally. I hold my hands up. Stuff sometimes is important to me. And sometimes I say, Lord, let me let it go. And I, I, but I don't, 
you know? And that is just me and my humanity. And I've got those books, and one day I might read them, and one day I won't. And I go to Keswick Convention, and I say, don't let me near the bookstall. Anyway, moving on. We won't talk about that book that I bought last week. Anyway, um, what's important to us? What do we invest our time in? What books are we reading? Are we reading the right books, actually? Are those books even useful? Some of them, yes, but there's only really one book. We've got all the answers in there, haven't we? I'm not going to focus too much on that element because we know, we know that God wants us to focus on the heavenly. He wants us to focus on the spiritual. Jesus wants to draw, draw us close to him so that we're in personal relationship with him, so that that's our priority, and that's where our treasure is. It's not in stuff. It's not even in our families. It's in him. Because if we focus on him, the rest will fall into place. And actually, when the rest of the stuff around us is chaotic, it might just be that we're focusing on the wrong thing. And we have to draw ourselves back to the one thing that's important. Are we building God's kingdom? Or are we just building the world? going to carry on with the reading. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that he comes and knocks and they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose, uh, whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. There is so much in there. Not only is our Father in Heaven pleased to give us his kingdom, but he sent his Son to serve. He will dress himself to serve. The Son of God will dress himself to serve. And verse 37 tells us that if the servants are ready when their master returns from the wedding banquet, he will dress himself to serve. But we too must be ready. This passage, I'm sure, reminds many of us of the story of the ten bridesmaids or ten virgins, depending on which version you read, where we have the five foolish and the five wise ones. And the wise ones had the oil that would keep the lamp burning way beyond when they needed it. But the foolish ones just had enough until they expected him to come. Let's not be caught out. Let's keep our focus where it needs to be. The Olympics have just started, you may have noticed. I don't know if anyone's been staying up into the small hours watching that. Athletes from across the world have been training and preparing for years for their moment. Their moment in the spotlight to prove that they are the best. They have given up no end of stuff to do that. A lot of time, a lot of energy, They'll have been training, they'll have been running, they'll have eaten the right things, they'll have had psychological training, all of that. Put that into the context of the men's 100 meter final. Years and years and years of total dedication for something that's over in less than 10 seconds. The world record is 9.58 seconds set in 2009 by Usain Bolt. It took me longer to tell you that than it took him to run it. You think I'm joking? That is how quick that is. So how much more then, how much energy should we be putting into this race we're running? And it won't always be easy, and we've heard that this morning, and we've had that echo throughout. 
I want to show you a, a video now. This is where Mark and Michelle scrabble at the back. You may have seen it. It's circulated for a long time, but there is a point to it. I'm sure many of you have seen that. And if you haven't, even having watched it a number of times this week, it gets me. 15 seconds in and that hamstring goes and his preparation and his training are for nothing. And our spiritual journey can be just like that. We can be doing the right things and we can be sailing along and praise the Lord, hallelujah, everything's great. And then something happens. And we're on the floor. And that can be all sorts of things. It can be illness. It can be a fall into sin. It can be doubt. It can be a bereavement. It can be all sorts of things that bring us down and stop us in our tracks. And I think that the, the tree in the picture this morning can also be the block, the, the point where we have to press on. He got back up. And his father came, and yeah, he had to fight his way through, but he had to finish the race. He had to cross the finish line. It was too important. He had to get there with help. But he got there, and the crowd went wild. I don't even know who won the race in the end but most people will remember that because that is how life can be and there may be people sitting here today and I know there are people sitting here today that are facing a really tough time but my word to you this morning is you have to get back up you have to keep moving forward you have to keep preparing Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like somebody running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We don't want to be disqualified. Derek Redmond was disqualified from that race, but to millions he was a winner because he battled on through. The good news is we're not in competition with each other. There's not just one of us that's going to get a gold medal here this morning. We can all have it. We can all have it. You don't look very excited by that. We can all have it. You know? It's like, you know, at the party when you do the pass the parcel and you have to make sure the music stops once for everyone. It's not like that. We can all have it. Do we all want it? Yes. Oh, hallelujah. I thought you'd gone to sleep on me there for a minute. So we're not in competition, but are we ready? Are we ready? And I can't say that enough. I felt a real sense of urgency this morning when, when we were praying that are we ready and there's a real sense of urgency the time is short I think one thing we do know is Jesus is coming back we don't know when now I don't know about you but all through my life whenever I've been set a deadline whether it's been homework or whether it's been in my career whatever it is I know when the deadline is and I will meet that deadline and sometimes it will be a little close to the deadline but I will meet it if there's a reason I'm not going to meet it, I'll renegotiate it, and that's fine. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when that deadline is. Let me say that again. We don't know when that deadline is. Only the Father knows when that deadline is. And when Jesus comes back, we won't have the benefit of hindsight. It'll be too late.
2 Timothy says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That sounds like right now to me. That sounds like our world right now. In actual fact, I could probably tick a few things on that list off that apply to me right now as I stand here, and that scares me. If Jesus comes today, if he walks through that door right now or appears at the front here, are we ready? What would he say to us? Would he be there with open arms welcoming us? Come. Come, Carol. Come, Jimmy. Come, Mel. I'm Steve. Or would he say, I don't even know you? That's a real sobering thought, isn't it? There are many examples in the Bible where Jesus says, You know, you can do all this stuff, but, you know, you don't really know me. I'm paraphrasing that, but there are many warnings in the Bible. He wants our heart. We're not going to get it right. We're going to leave here today and we might be determined to go down the right path and something will happen and knock us straight back off again. But just like Derek did, we've got to get back up, get on the path and keep running the race. No matter how hard it is, no matter how tough it is, no matter how difficult it is, how much we don't know what's in the future and how heartbroken and, and sad and distressed and all those things we are. It's about moving forward. We can't change anything behind us. Nothing. Anything that's gone before this second that we're experiencing right now, we cannot change. But we can change the future. Jesus told us to love the Lord our God, to love our neighbors. If we could just do those two things, all of us here this morning, we could change the world. One person at a time. It's simple. It's so simple. So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to do that? Why is it so easy to, to argue and to, to nitpick and to gossip? Why is that so much easier than doing the right thing sometimes? Because we're human. We're flawed. And we never get it right this side of eternity. But let's not panic and let's not be discouraged because our God is amazing and we have sung some beautiful worship songs this morning and the words in there are stunning. I think if you actually read some of the words of some of the worship songs that we sing, it brings us such hope. The song about hope is beautiful because Jesus is our hope. He is the truth, the way and the life. We can't get to the Father except through him. No one on the planet can. That is the truth. But let's be encouraged because Paul, the Apostle Paul, is a great example of a human being. When we first read about him, he is standing watching Stephen be murdered, executed, martyred, and he approves. He's holding the coats. He's a young man. He approves. He spends a lot of his life as a terrorist for want of a better world persecuting and murdering Christians and then he has his road to Damascus experience, then he meets Jesus and it turns around and he goes on to give us a really good portion of the New Testament a lot of words that I read you today come from that man the terrorist that is now an evangelist that has put all the energy that he had into persecuting Christians 
into recruiting for Jesus. What an amazing testimony that is. Can you imagine if some of the people that are going around the world causing these atrocities right now were to turn publicly to Jesus, what impact that would have? And I know that Muslims have been entering churches after what happened in that church in France. And that is amazing that good can come out of such an awful situation. Can you even comprehend how valuable you are to God? How much he loves you? That he sends Jesus to die for you and for me, for all the sin that we will ever commit, ever in our earthly lives, for all the sin that everybody on the planet ever has, ever does, ever will commit. He lives a perfect life, sacrifices himself completely. Even the hairs on our head have been numbered. That's how precious we are. So let's just keep hold of that. Let's be encouraged by that. Let's tell other people that. Because they matter too. And time is short. And we don't know how short. Today could be our last for one reason or another. Let's make it count. I'm going to finish by reading Paul's words from Philippians 3. And I'm going to read it from the message version. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have made it. But I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself as an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those you see running the same course, headed for the same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times. Sadly, I'm having to do it again. All they want is Easy Street. They hate Christ's cross, but Easy Street is dead end street. Those who live there make their bellies their gods, belches their praise. All they can think of is their appetites, but there's far more to life for us. We're citizens of high heaven. We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. He will make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he is putting everything as it should be under and around him. Amen.